Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us today on today's webinar, Insider Risk Management Advanced Features, Adaptive Protection and Forensic Evidence. My name is Ayman Abdelmajid. I'm a digital specialist here at Microsoft, and I will be the MC. Uh, with us today are two um, fantastic um, people today, very knowledgeable on the topic. We have Steve Thomas, who is our senior technical specialist, and Richard Becerra, who is our technical specialist. Um, we really thank everybody for taking the time out of your day and joining us. Uh, we hope to have a phenomenal uh, webinar for you today. Um, and as you know, for those of us that have joined us previously, we love to start these off with a dad joke. Um, and I think uh, we're gonna keep that tradition alive. So Richard, I have a dad joke for you. Are you ready? Ooh, I wanna hear it. Cool. All right. Well, this is my best. This is my best dad joke. Uh, what do lawyers wear to court? Tell me. A lawsuit. <laughs> I love it. Uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Richard. Um, and I thank you so much. I much appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So I take it everybody can see my screen here, or at least the people who are talking right now. Yes. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending our webinar. Uh, I don't want to eat up too much of a time for an intro. My name is Richard Becerra. I am a technical specialist for compliance here at Microsoft, and I will be co-presenting with uh, my colleague Steve Thomas with a special contribution by Robert Myers, another colleague of mine. So without wasting too much time, let's dive on in and see what we're talking about here. So information, as we know, has always been worth something to someone. Secrets are valuable. This is something that's been true ever since Roman times when the first ciphers were created all the way up to modern day encryption. I want what you have and I wanna make sure you don't know when I get it, or I care more about doing my job that you hired me for than I do about your security. The reasons are the same, regardless of how the technology, regardless of how the culture changes, the root causes are there. There's profit to be made, or there's admins responsible for protecting the data. Either way, data is a hunted commodity. So how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Well, first we're gonna start with understanding how an IRM program is important and how these features, adaptive protection and forensic evidence can help. To understand that, we do need to understand a little bit about how insider threats have manifested in the past. So we're going to talk a little about how they got away with what they did, um, how the technology and the culture made it possible, the factors that enabled their success for so long, and we're going to see how that technology would address those threats today. So let's dive right in. We have first up Robert Hansen. Some of you may know this man. Uh, for 22 years, conducted espionage for the Soviet Union for, you know, against the FBI, stole documents, uh, sold them information. When he was arrested, he specifically said it was all about money. He just wanted to get more of it. How was that possible? So over his long career, he became known as the FBI cybersecurity expert. And because of that, as he climbed the ladder, he did so quickly. And climbing that ladder led to more trust, more access. Everybody just kind of assumed somebody else had already deemed him trustworthy. After all, you don't become a head counterintelligence agent if you're not trustworthy or if you're even just a bad liar. The same way no one ever became CEO without knowing what they were doing. As his access continued to expand, he did have multiple incidents that happened. So he attempted to hack uh, his supervisor's computer at one point. He ran searches against his own information in the FBI's database, trying to see if he was being investigated. And he periodically uh, disclosed sensitive information when he was speaking to suspects or other uh, counterintelligence assets. All of these red flags were never aggregated in one place where an analyst could have seen a clear pattern. 
And every time somebody did bring it to someone's attention, there was an explanation and everybody assumed that because he was who he was, he either had a good reason for it or there was some reason that they didn't understand. He was not discovered until an unrelated investigation in the year 2000 that just happened to turn up his activity. Up until that point, people just assumed he must be on the level, he must be legitimate. So another example here is a man named Aldrich Heisen Ames. Again, you may know this man. He worked for the CIA, did something similar during the same time as Hansen. He sold documents to the USSR. Almost at the start of his career, within the first year, there were memoranda complaints put into his employee profile that posed or that described the potential risk he posed. Uh, these were considered eyes only, but they were all part of his employee profile. They said uh, he has a problem with money. He has a problem handling data. And then throughout the rest of his career, similar reprimands took place. Uh, similar complaints made by other employees as well. And at one point he had a negative employee review. His uh, work overseas was classified as mildly satisfactory by the CIA which you know, doesn't really give you, as a spy, the warm and fuzzies. And at one point in his career, yes, he literally walked boxes of classified documents to his car and drove them home. None of these red flags were ever aggregated in one place either. And this is how he was able to get away with his disclosure for nine years. But lest we assume they're all national security threats, most insiders are not. Most insiders are just ordinary people trying to get their job done. So how do we address those? So this is an anonymous contractor, and this is from my colleague, Robert Myers. This person needed to do some extra work. She just wanted to get her project to where her client was asking her to. There were security controls in place that meant she couldn't remote in, she couldn't use a VPN. If she wanted to do work on these files, she had to drive into the office. And this client allowed their uh, contractors to bring in music devices, iPods, uh, iPhones, things like that. So what she discovered while she was working is that the contractor, the person that she was working with, they didn't monitor MP3 files. They were allowed to come and go as needed. So what she would do is just change the file type to an MP3, move it onto her phone, drive it home and work, and just come back on Monday and put it back on the computer. So she wasn't trying to steal the data. She wasn't trying to sell it to anybody, but the data was still put at risk. The phone could have been stolen, could have been lost. If her phone was compromised by malware that she wasn't aware of, somebody else could have exfiltrated it. So even though she wasn't trying to hurt the agency that she was working with, she was still putting their data at risk. And this is an argument against not only putting in file type monitoring, but also not letting MP3 specifically go, which I have seen other customers try to do. But the point is not every insider threat is malicious. So what, is, what can we learn from this? What does this teach us? IRM is there for long-term answers to problems. We're not using this and you shouldn't consider it for some kind of point in place solution. Uh, if you need to stop somebody from sending an email, DLP, sensitivity labels, there are a lot of tools for that. IRM is there to help you either stop the intentional threats from going on for years, or it's there to stop the accidental threats that discover a loophole or a flaw in the security that the SOC team didn't know about and that nobody could have predicted or even planned on. Either way, IRM is there to help you prevent things from going unnoticed and getting the data out for a long period of time. And because that's usually people trying to intentionally exfiltrate data, it's harder to catch them. That's why the program has to be a little more complicated and more sophisticated. So how does that tie into modern day technology with adaptive protection? 
So far, we've talked about IRM in the context of detection, identifying the threat, but we're leaving the action of what to do mostly to the SOC team, which means a human has to look at the information before they can make a decision. Somebody says, this is a threat, let's turn off his account. But sometimes you can't wait for a SOC team to do that. Uh, it takes time for a security analyst to get an email or get an alert, read it, understand it, understand the context the alert was generated in, maybe access the portal and turn off somebody's account. Especially if it's off hours or it's on the weekend, you may not have the time to wait for that. And sometimes you just need protection to take place automatically. But there's a flip side to that. It's a double edged sword because we don't want to interrupt people from doing their work and we don't want to prevent them from being able to talk to each other over email. We want to have the best of both worlds. How do we do that? Adaptive protection is one approach. So we're going to take an example here and I'm going to show you how this works. We're going to start with our friends uh, Rebecca and Chris, our data admin. Uh, Rebecca is going to get the chance to print something out. Uh, poor Chris here, he's going to land himself in a little bit of hot water. Let's see what happens. So Chris here's our young go-getter. He's a data admin and he's been shopping his resume around looking for a job that uh, pays, excuse me, pays a little better than what he's got. And he talks to a company that's really interested in hiring him. We'll call them Smoogle for the example here. And uh, Smoogle says, you know, we'd like to bring you on board. We want to pay you a lot of money. If you could bring us some information from your current employer, that would actually sweeten the pot. We might be able to throw some hiring bonuses on there for you. And Chris, being a data admin, knows he has access to some of this info. Being young in his career, thinks oh, that's a pretty good deal. I can pull that off and agrees. So, Chris here is going to start down here at the very bottom left hand corner uh, where you can see this little yellow dot. Now he doesn't know it, but we're already watching his activity with IRM purely because he has standing elevated access. Most employees don't. He's an admin and for that reason, we're already paying a little bit closer attention. So Chris holding his job offer from Smoogle in hand goes back to his workstation and starts saying, all right, let's see what I can get for them pulls a couple of documents that have sensitivity labels on them that provide encryption. Just kind of pulls them off of a lot of documents because Smoogle requested around uh, 20,000 documents from a SharePoint repository. So that's uh, warning number two. We're already, we're already looking at his activity because he's an admin, so we're going to elevate that a little further because now as an admin, he's doing something suspicious, and that poses a greater risk than if some frontline worker were doing it. So he pulls all these labels off of all this stuff, and then he downloads them from SharePoint to his computer. And he's gonna figure out how to get them out of there after that. And let's say Chris decides he also wants to keep his two weeks notice in place. He wants to have a good work record, and he wants to get that nice severance pay or retirement, or he wants to hold on to maybe his vacation hours. So he doesn't just wanna walk out the door with him and leave without notice. So he turns in his resignation to the HR portal. That bumps him up into an even higher risk category. IRM is still watching all this activity and it's relating it in context to the other activity that it's already recorded. So then Chris decides he's going to print some of this stuff out. You know, sneaker debt, getting it out of the office will be easiest to just put it on some paper, fold them up and stick it in his pocket. That's what he decides to do. He'll figure out the rest later. He's already been elevated to a high enough risk level that IRM has moved him into a DLP policy that blocks the ability to print files. Chris doesn't know this. He hasn't gotten any alerts that tell him this is happening. It happens automatically in the cloud as a result of his prior activity. And every single action he takes after that is going to elevate his risk level further, either extending the amount of time his account spends in that block status, or it's going to accelerate the, uh, or it's going to enhance rather, the blocking actions that take place. And this can depend on how many DLP policies you decide to build. So Chris then decides, well, I can't print them out. Let's see if I can uh, copy them to this 
USB stick that I use for my BitLocker. It's meant for logging into the computer, but it can hold files too. He tries to do that, and that same DLP policy blocks. And because he took yet another suspicious activity, he gets bumped up into an even higher risk level threshold, which is going to keep his actions blocked for even longer. So, attempting to exfiltrate data while holding a privileged role in the organization led to Chris getting his activity blocked. Now, he doesn't have to stay that way. He might well have a legitimate reason for having to do all this. Maybe he's not committing corporate espionage, but that's something your SOC team will need to determine. And we don't necessarily want to just implicitly trust that his intentions are good. We want to look at his activity. And until we can make that score for ourselves, we want to err on the side of caution and block. Now that's our data admin, Chris. Why doesn't Rebecca get the same experience? Let's see here. For one, Rebecca is a marketing manager. She doesn't have the ability to adjust anybody's permissions. There's all kinds of areas she can't access in your environment. So we don't have to watch her activity as closely because there's already a limit on what she can do. But she does still work with our data. Maybe she works with healthcare info. She's got some access to documents that have addresses. So we do want to pay attention. Now, normally she moves some info back and forth over Teams, over SharePoint, through email as part of her regular job. But on this day, she decides to send a bunch of documents to her coworker over Teams. It's a little more than normal for her. So, okay, we're going to bump up our awareness of her activity a little bit more. And then some of those same files, she goes ahead and tries to print out. And they have a sensitivity label on them or they contain content that we care about that is a little more sensitive than just a normal email trying to arrange a lunch for everyone. At that point, we move her account automatically into that second category, the one that says block and override. She gets a message that says, hey, you're trying to print this data out. It is sensitive and we've automatically adjusted your account. Now you're still allowed to do it, but you're gonna have to give us a reason so we can examine it. That's fine. Rebecca types in a reason and goes about printing her files out. And then maybe a week later, a couple of days later, maybe a month later, those are time periods you can adjust. She sends an email to her PR agency after doing her regular job every day. And by that point, enough time has passed that she doesn't have to be considered a threat anymore. So now she can email that confidential file. She might get a message, but we're not gonna block the activity and tell her she has to override it and give us a reason. This is how you can separate identifying what their activity is between malicious and inadvertent, and you can apply different controls. Somebody needs to be blocked and somebody just needs to be educated. IRM can do this automatically. You don't need a SOC team anymore looking through logs, looking through time and date stamps and cross-referencing files. We're handling that for you so the activity can happen faster and you don't need to try and staff up an army to manage these threats. Now, this is a feature, forensic evidence, that is coming soon to GCC. It's not there yet, but we are introducing it. We're hoping to get it there uh, as quickly as possible. This is something that can be used in highly regulated industries. So government and financial industries come to mind. If you have certain workstations, dedicated uh, privileged access workstations, for example, and you need to not only monitor the activity on them, but record it for future purposes, forensic evidence allows IRM to start doing that automatically. Now, this is screen recording, and we understand that's a little bit of a security concern, so we built the user privacy into it. So you have to opt into it. Your security teams can't just go in and start recording everybody's activity. Uh, you can scope the permissions to it as narrowly as you want, and you can decide what policies are going to activate this along with everything else. But at this point, this is what gives your security teams context. And when they're assessing insider risks, context tends to be everything. So now, instead of just looking at logs, instead of looking at reports and alerts, 
they can actually see what a person was doing on their computer at the time an alert was triggered. So now you can see, did somebody uh, record moving this email out? Were they typing in sensitive information and they had to just backspace over it or they accidentally sent it to too many people, uh, anything like that? Now they can use that context to make a decision and they can retain that information. They can store it in their own repository if you need to keep it for further purposes. And again, this can be all automated. So now you're assessing your insider threats. You've automatically implemented protection and you might be blocking their activity and you're recording their activity potentially as they escalated their own risk. So if it comes time to turn things over to HR or it comes time to justify to a supervisor, hey, we just need to educate this person. We don't need to cost them their job. Your SOC teams have the information to do that. There's a lot more certainty that can be assessed here with forensic evidence and the adaptive protection. And it takes a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the personnel requirement out of it. So now you can identify those threats uh, in a way that would have taken a dozen people a week to do previously. Now I want to finish this up with this final quote from my colleague, Robert Myers. This has been his teaching phrase for a decade and for good reason. What we've noticed among customers with insider risk is that they get intimidated by the complicated nature of it. So many companies and agencies delay putting controls in place until everything is just right. They want to impact their business, their daily operations as little as possible. The problem is incidents and breaches don't wait for things to be ready. And so when they happen during that delay, many agencies don't have something stood up. There are no controls or logging that's in place. And when that happens, they have a very hard time remediating the problem, figuring out what went wrong, what got out, uh, who the threats were. Our IRM solution exists today has an easy solution to turn on and get started with. It is a button that you can turn on and start getting insights. Within 48 hours, it will come back and it will tell you what potential risks you may have, areas you might need to pay attention to. It's transparent to your employees. They're not gonna get alerts. Nobody's getting blocked until you tell IRM to start doing that. So if you have this, if you're licensed for it, turn it on. Get the insights, get the analytics, start there and start building up your IRM program even as you're getting that visibility. Don't wait for everything to be just right or you're going to get caught without any controls in place and be scrambling to stand something up in a hurry. Now, if you wanna know more, I've included some resources here at the end of this slide. Uh, we also have ongoing webinars, not specific to IRM or adaptive protection, where you can learn more about the things we're doing. We're doing a uh, webinar in September on open AI in Microsoft, and we have a full history of past webinars that you can look up as well. And we'll share this slide deck after this uh, presentation. But that's going to be it for me. Otherwise, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Steve Thomas, for a live demo so we can see what these controls look like and I'm not just boring you to death with PowerPoint. Steve, are you ready on your end? I am. I I, I can't figure out which is funnier, the uh, dad joke or smoogle. Uh, <laughs> I'm still I, I, I'm still reeling for that. So let, let, let me share my screen real quick. And I will wait for confirmation to make sure that folks can see my screen. Yep, I'm looking at it right here. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I'm Steve Thomas. I am a teammate and colleague of Richard. And what I want to do is kind of bolt on to some of the stuff that Richard was talking about today by showing you how a lot of this stuff is implemented in the Microsoft Purview console. 
Now, um, I can't amplify R Richard's uh, earlier statement strong enough that uh, there is, if you have purview G5, or if you purchased uh, the IRM SKU, uh, there is no reason why you shouldn't turn this stuff on immediately on day one. Because when you turn turning on insider risk management is going to kind of start the ball rolling uh, for anything that you might want to do later on down the road. And uh, as Richard said, it's, it's it's one click to turn on. And after about 48 hours, you're already going to have some rich analytics and insights to look at. Uh, in this particular case, I've turned this on in this particular demo tenant here. And after a couple of days, it's a small tenant. But still, even though it's a small tenant, over the last uh, several days, it's noticed based upon analyzing many signals in Microsoft 365 that there has been some interesting activities around data leaks. Um, you know, lots of files have been being copied to USB. There has been not a lot, but there are some anomalous exfiltration volumes and uh, this exfiltration volume seems to correlate with the same percentage of users that are involving sensitive information. So this is um, very good information and very good insights. And again, it took one click. Uh, it's designed for the personas that will actually be doing the visibility and the investigation. The strength of the purview uh, product line is we design these workloads for risk officers, CISOs, compliance officers, uh, data governance officers. We don't design this stuff for IT pros. IT pros do other things. This is meant to be leveraged by those who are, whether they're involved with HR, whether they're involved with security or a V team of multiples, or even if you are resource constrained. Um, and you're the only person at your organization or agency that is responsible for this. this. There are many things within Purview Insider Risk Management that can be leveraged um, to replace uh, manual resources with automation and AI. And uh, you know, Richard and I have done webinars before on insider risk management. One of the strengths that we wanted to talk about in this particular webinar is around the um, adaptive protection. Now, once you've turned on insider risk management, once you've had some visibility into the activities that are going on, you can then mitigate potential risk with adaptive protection protection also with a single click from the console. One click on the home page of the compliance portal. This is the fastest way and the most recommended way to get started with adaptive protection. You don't need any, you, you can do this without having any pre-existing insider risk management data policies or DLP policy settings. Uh, even if you, in fact, I would tell you that if you are new to purview and you're trying you're doing a trial of purview you can just immediately start here you can come here to insider risk management turn it on and then turn on adaptive protection and you'll already be doing 90 percent of what you need to do to get in front of these of 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 of, of potential data uh, exfiltration issues potential data leaks uh, or you know even you know breaches that could get you into the media for not the great <laughs> the greatest of reasons. And when, when you turn this on, it's going to scan all the activities like data exfiltration, events leading to potential data uh, theft, um, you know all the stuff that we looked at in the previous analytics screen. And then using that information, AI through adaptive protection is going to set up for you an insider risk management policy and then use the policy to detect users risk levels. And it's also going to set up DLP policies with the risk level condition to enable adaptive protection. Now, the policies are going to be set to run in test mode initially, so you can fine tune as needed. But again, right here, turn on and you are good to go. And of course, I will tell you though, uh, it may take up to 72 hours before the associated insider risk management and the DLP policies are created. And then you can actually start expecting to see the risk levels and DLP actions applied to applicable user activities. So once 
adaptive protection is turned on the policies created. You can see the DLP policies created under insider risk management. No human did this. Uh, this was actually done by uh, IRM itself. And then, of course, you'll see those, also see those adaptive DLP policies under data loss prevention and then policies. Now, let's talk a little bit about how um, Purview Insider Risk Management leverages the machine learning to assign the risk labels. Now, um, let's, let's go back to Chris. Remember, Richard was talking about this potential rogue admin named Chris. Well, let's dive into Chris a little bit and let's talk about what was happening behind the scenes with insider risk management. Now, in insider risk management, um, we can see a summary of Chris's risk factors here. Now, and in, in, I, I want full disclosure here, in the real world, I'm not necessarily gonna know this is Chris because Insider risk management understands the issues of bias and the issues of things needing to be above board and potentially hold up in legal matters down the road. So we're doing something here called pseudonymization where we've anonymized the users to me, the IRM investigator. But behind the scenes, this anonymous uh, uh, pseudonym is actually going to tie back to the actual individual user account. In this case, it's Chris. So um, I'm peeling back the onion a little bit there, to, but I do want to explain that I did not know this was Chris initially because of the way the pseudonymization works. Now, um, now let's say this here represents you know Chris's you know risk level here. We are. Um, He's been detected, as you can see, as a potential high impact user, meaning his damage potential is greater um, if, if he abuses or actually you know, mi misuses his access. We can see that due to his access patterns with sensitive information, his level in the organization and the fact that he is an global admin, that's very much high impact here. And so when we click on view all details, we're gonna see here of the side that this is due to his you know, access patterns. This is due to global admin and the level in the org's Azure AD hierarchy is 77% of, of all users. So we're looking at a variety of factors to determine a simple risk level here. Now, um, he, he's also exfiltrated data more than 90% of his peers and shared much more SharePoint files externally compared to others with the same access. And then we can go look at the scatter plot of all of his user activity. And this is where we start telling the story. This is where we actually start looking at this uh, from, from a timeline perspective. As you can see, it looks like he's, we see here he's submitted his resignation. He's going to be leaving the company. And that's also immediately going to uh, elevate his risk. As Richard explained earlier, you see the levels, as Rich was explaining, going up and up and up and up. It was because of all these events here being tracked and adaptive protection immediately elevating the, uh, the, the risk level here. He also has some potentially risky activities before the resignation here. He's accessed confidential files on SharePoint Online at a rate that is unusual. In this case, 500% above average compared to his last 60 days of historical activity. Um, you know, we're looking at relativity here. You know, if your regular job involves a lot of moving around of data, that's not going to necessarily raise the same red flag as would be when it becomes anom an anomalous behavior here. Um, finally, we see that uh, Chris has uh, submitted his re re resignation. He performed a, when, that when he when he did before or before he submitted his resignation, he performed a sequence, which is a series of related activities, which we define as being a powerful indicator of intent. 
in this particular example here, he downgraded sensitivity labels on several files in SharePoint. Remember, he's a global admin. Uh, and so he was downgrading the sensitivity labels, then downloading those files to his laptop, then renaming those files, and then emailing them to his personal email. Uh, this is where we start seeing, you know, serious smoking guns here. So, you know, let's go back to, you know, how this was, uh, looked at from a visual perspective when 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 Richard brought this up here you know, want to rehash here based on these factors Chris has an elevated adaptive protection level so we're automatically and adaptively applying stricter levels of protection controls to him to stop him from stealing I mean it's exfiltrating more data and again it's all due to this adaptive protection leveraging that machine learning to identify and mitigate the most critical risk with the most effective protection controls dynamically. And this is going to save your security team's valuable time while ensuring ba better data security. It's also going to help later on down the road should we have to deal with prosecutions as well. Uh, the capability is built into this Microsoft platform and so far everything that we have uh, in 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 for for the Windows world is agent list because this stuff is built into this. You can get this started immediately today without having to create a, a, a disruptive deployment plan to your end user devices. All right, so um, we talked about the easy buttons. Now let's dive into a little bit of granularity here. Now, uh, the custom setup option is going to allow you to customize the insider risk management policy, the risk levels, and your DLP policies configured for adaptive protection. You can just leave in place what happens automatically, uh, or you can dive in and customize the risk levels a little bit more. So to customize your adaptive protection setup, we go back to the insider risk management uh, blade in the Microsoft purview portal, and we're going to click on adaptive protection. And uh, when we click on adaptive protection, this is going to um, take us to our basically our summary screen, which is going to tell us the policies that we've created, the users that are now in scope, and the current users assigned risk levels. Two have elevated risk, one has a minor risk. Um, now, um, moving on, when we actually look at the uh, risk levels, we can then see that we have um, the, we can now edit each risk level based on the organization's risk appetite here, uh, because you may not ex want to, uh, you may not necessarily want to use what we have out of the box for uh, risk labels, you might want to fine tune and define them. So in this particular case, we're going to uh, select the particular policy that we want to adjust, and then we're going to click edit, and then the custom risk level um, is, is, is going to give us the, uh, first of all, we can select this by default, which is alert generated or confirmed for a user, or look at specific um, uh, user activity. And if we click the drop down for high, we can then, of course, um, you know, adjust that. And then if we want to um, select instead specific user activity, we can, of course, select that. But if you just if you decide to define risk levels based on specific activity, you're going to choose the activity to detect its severity and the number of daily occurrences during the past activity detection window. So I, I, I would advise that if you go in here and do this, you want to make sure that you really have a solid understanding of what you're doing here, because in some cases you might set these risk le levels lower than you intended. Uh, you know, for the, for example, for the activities condition, the options you choose are from are automatically updated for the types of activities you, you've defined as the indicators configured in the associated IRM policy. Um, for example, if, you, if you've chosen a policy based on the data leaks policy template, the built-in risk activity choices will apply to indicators and activities available in that policy. Now, here, 
you can see a few indicators and built in machine learning models, including sequence detection and cumulative exfiltration detection and the associated IRM policy as examples. You know, let's choose the machine learning enabled condition, detect when a user's exfiltration policies exceed organizational norms. Now let's define the activity severity. And let's select high. Now, confirm now if you um, if you want to see which users are assigned a risk level, you can then visit the users assigned risk level pages. And again, notice all the user information is pseudonymized by default, as you can see on the screen. Here you can review the anonymized users that have been detected at varying levels of risk, and you can even click into each user to see which policies are in scope for them. Um, you can also see the detected user activities that match the condition of the, of, of the assigned risk level here. We get really, really deep into um, the you know the granularity um, when and and at the same time you can kind of monitor and use this to to fine tune the adaptive protection, uh, especially if you're if, if if you're concerned that you're seeing a lot of noise um, and and in in in. The signal to noise ratio is not where you would want it or not where you're necessarily where your SOC would want it. Now, adaptive protection also can allow you to create uh, policies in DLP that leverage this adaptive feature as well. I mean, we 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 know most of our customers might already have invested heavily in our DLP solution and have many exi existing policies already. Endpoint DLP is one of the most popular um, uh, products within the uh, purview suite. And the good news is that you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel to leverage adaptive protection with DLP. You can make your existing static DLP policies adaptive by adding the new condition for adaptive protection. So for example, if we look at the Project Copperfield policy here, um, this policy was created to protect confidential uh, information related to this project Copperfield. And um, we can then edit the policy. And uh, again, we can choose the locations. And, and I'll, I'll tell you that uh, adaptive protection does support multiple workloads, including exchange teams and devices. So any DLP policies for those workloads can be converted from static to adaptive. And here we can go in and, and, and edit the advanced uh, rules. In this policy, there are existing static conditions configured to look for certain sensitive information types and also a specific sender domain. Now, uh, I can build on top of that uh, existing condition by, uh, un by adding a condition. I can see an option there to actually add the user's risk level for adaptive protection is. And then you will need to select one or more risk levels. And Again, the elevated risk level is going to show us, you know, elevated risk level, moderate risk level, minor risk level. And you can choose multiple if needed. And uh, once the uh, risk level for adaptive protection is configured, the DLP policy becomes adaptive and it only applies to the elevated risk users. Therefore, we can change this DLP policy from audit mode to block mode or to effectively blocking high-risk users from exfiltrating data. And um, here, I'm going to choose the block mode to prevent users from uploading sensitive data defined in this policy to a restricted cloud service domain. And we can update all the controls 
to block mode if needed. Uh, you can see the comprehensive controls DLP offers here, including blocking users from copying to clipboard and USB device or printing. And again, you can run the policy in test mode or and fine tune the policy before publishing it as always. And now the DLP policy has become adaptive. This means you can quickly and simply build on all the investments in DLP you've made over the years. Uh, just adding a little bit of, uh, of AI to it. The, the ideal use case here is to take any policies that may be noisy, add the adaptive condition to them so you can focus on addressing the most critical risk while saving valuable time and keeping your tracking uh, uh, signal to noise ratio, more signals and less noise, if that makes sense. Okay, now, in the last part of the webinar, Richard mentioned we were we were um, going to be coming up with a solution in GCC soon. It's not available yet that extends the insider risk management capabilities to uh, allowing you to actually capture forensic evidence on the device. Um, and again, the forensic there, there, there is some uh, logistics around this uh, additional feature. There are some uh, capacities that are included with IRM. You can purchase additional capacity if you needed. Uh, the ability to capture and upload is going to be based on and how much is going to be based on how much capacity your org has actually purchased. But you'll be able to monitor that capacity and billing from the exact same console. As you can see here, I've, I've used um, um, uh, 15 gigs of my free 20 gig capacity. And then of course, I've also used some significant of my paid capacity. And so I have a total of 45 gigs available. And uh, of course, I will point out that you can then control um, how much capturing will actually occur. I do have to tell you though, that uh, you will need to deploy in advance an additional agent. Um, everything else we talked about here, uh, when, when it comes to Windows and uh, uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11 devices, is agentless with the exception of the forensics evidence. The forensic evidence is going to require the additional purview agent to be deployed. As and 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 again, you, you also probably are aware that if you want to take advantage of these capabilities on Mac OS, the Mac OS will also have uh, uh, an agent required for uh, IRM and DLP. And of course, you can set things like the capturing window, the upload bandwidth limit, the offline capturing cache limit as well. Uh, you can also download and deploy the um, Microsoft Purview client for Windows here. Um, it gives you, of course, all of the health of the devices with the Purview client installed. Again, this is probably the most IT pro-ish of, 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 of what you're going to see with Purview IRM because, again, you want to make sure that the agent is deployed and the agent is healthy. Uh, so you won't have to find out the hard way that you aren't able to capture anything because the agent either had not been deployed or was not actually functioning. Um, you can also customize notification templates. If, if, if you want to notify users that forensic evidence capturing will be turned on for the devices, some policies uh, and some regulators do require this as well. In addition, you have um, your user management and your forensic evidence request. Um, and then of course you have your policies as well. Your policies are where you would actually create a forensic evidence policy. And when you create that, it's going to, you're going to choose the scope of user activity to capture here. In this particular case, you want to find out what device activity do you want to capture? Um, now, if you already have a policy that captures all user activity, uh, it's not going to let you create a second one like that. And of course, um, you also will have to uh, configure some additional prerequisites if you actually want to capture web browsing activity as well, but you can do that with this. And we're going to actually go through and we're going to turn on the indicators. You can also um, uh, specify websites as, as well.
Looks like we're waiting. Waiting. So let's instead, let's go back. Let's look at an existing one. So looks like I'm running into some problems with the tenant here, but uh, as I, as I mentioned, you can if if you can either choose to select all uh, activities or you can be granular with the type of activities that you actually want to capture here. Again, this is not yet available in GCC, but uh, it is coming. If you have a commercial version or a commercial test tenant, if you want to actually try this out, you can do that as well. And um, as Richard mentioned, you also have the capability of going in there and, and viewing directly from the console a captured cl uh, a clip as well. You saw an earlier screenshot from. Um, from Richard about this, and let's see if we can get this working here. And you can kind of see what the experience looks like. Christine is currently, looks like she's in OWA. Typing information in. If you notice, some of this is time lapsed. Now, again, um, in most cases, your job is probably just to collect the information, not to actually and 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 make sure the information is called. It's usually going to be investigators, uh, legal team, uh, or other uh, personas that are actually going to examine the content and do the investigation. Um, but this information is going to be ready for them. And of course, we have granular role capabilities within Microsoft Purview, so you can do further delegation for insider risk management as well and the great thing is this works in conjunction with uh, our other compliance products including our, uh, our products that allow you to uh, discover and respond to legal requests for example um, in, in, in terms of supplying evidence but um, again that's the forensic evidence feature that's coming and um, also, I want to point out that uh, once you've turned on insider risk management as well, you're going to have a lot of guidelines and a lot of prescriptive guidance around what you should do. Um, again, you can do this, but I would highly encourage that you first look at adaptive protection because adaptive protection is going to save you even more time. These th this stuff here was is going to save you time, but. Uh, Adaptive protection is going to save you uh, time more down the road, um, especially. So that concludes my portion of it. And um, we have about uh, five minutes if we have any active questions or any unresolved questions. We are clear in the Q&A, but of course, folks are welcome to drop their questions in as you'd like. Excellent. So. Let me just.
close out by, um, again, recommending that uh, if you want to look more at in detail the documentation around adaptive protection, aka aka.ms forward slash AP docs. Um, there's also a mechanics video as well, AP mechanics. And as always, um, aka.ms forward slash purview trial if you would like to try this stuff out for yourself. All right, I think we're good, right, Adam? Yeah, I think so. Thank Excellent. you, Steve. So on behalf of Richard and uh, Eamon um, and Adam and, of course, our fearless, fearless leader, Barry Wong, uh, thank you very much. And feel free to uh, reach out to uh, your Microsoft representative if you would like to have further discussion on this. Likewise, thank you everybody for your time and uh, for letting us talk to y'all today. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>